Greetings and welcome back, everybody. My name is Piotr, and this is the Global Gambit. Now, the gambit we're going to be exploring this time uh, are the Balkans, uh, specifically the Western Balkans. Uh, the Western Balkans are located, well, in the West, um, but uh, tend to comprise much of former Yugoslavia um, amongst a few other nations as well. Now, the reason I wanted to have this conversation is a few different reasons, but uh, longstandingly, it is related to what is ongoing in Ukraine uh, and the ramifications, the spillover effects for uh, a certain, you know, variety of different communities in the states in the region uh, particularly serbia has been in the news for different region uh, reasons given its relationship with russia um, but so has bosnia more recently uh, as well as obviously the ongoing tensions between um, uh, montenegro serbia albania kosovo and serbia particularly uh, joining me to have the uh, very wide-ranging and comprehensive conversation are a few um absolutely stellar i think professors no another really way to put it uh first off we have um uh professor dan sower uh who's been uh researching at johns hopkins size for a long time he's, he's a former state department special envoy uh and we actually had him on the podcast before and before the delightful technical gods decided to get in the way and prevent me from actually uploading that episode but professor <laughs> it's great to have you back um professor edward joseph who is a foreign pre foreign policy analyst with Ooh, 15 years of field experience in the Balkans, Iraq, Afghanistan. Uh, and he was actually uh, targeted by the Serbian government uh, relatively recently, uh, which I will be uh, posting in the uh, in the links above um, uh, a tweet where he was being defended um, uh, by some colleagues as well, given the tense relations between Pristina, the capital of Kosovo, uh, and Belgrade, the capital of Serbia. And then very last, uh, we have, but not least, certainly, we have Professor Volkovic, who is the Director of Global Policy, um, or the MAGP program at SAIS. He's also a Senior Lecturer of Conflict Management. It was a bit of a last minute. He, he was like, oh, I'm interested to join, and I'm delighted that he was able to. <laughs> so uh, thank you all very much, professors, for joining me. Um, I'm definitely going to lose track of who's who and who's just spoken at some point, but none the, nevertheless, we shall persevere. Um, I think maybe jumping to um, uh, Professor Joseph to start with, and please remember to on mic, uh, Professor, is um, could you just give us a little bit of a broad overview of the relationship of the Balkans to the situation in Ukraine at the moment? Thank you, Piotr. And great to be with you and Sanisha and Dan on this call. And uh, yes, it's very simple. And for your viewers, if they can uh, just remember the number one, just the number one, not two, just the number one, will understand exactly why there's disorder in the Balkans and how it relates to Ukraine and how Ukraine itself could be the key to the Balkans. So where we begin, Piotr, it's February, 2023. Well, one year ago on the 24th, 2022, February uh, 24th, 20, uh, one year ago, we had this uh, devastating Russian invasion. What's happened in that year? Very simply, Russia has gotten weaker, more isolated, the West has gotten more unified, unprecedented unity in the West. We have this Zeitenwende in Germany. We have Finland and Sweden joining NATO. We have these remarkable developments, unprecedented series of sanctions on Russia. What would we have expected of these small Balkans countries? None of these countries have nuclear weapons. They're not in any position to stand up to the West or to anything like this. We would have expected all of them, including those with traditional affinity with Russia, to to say, hey, wait a minute, we don't want to be aligned with this uh, uh, Russia. Look at this inept Putin. He can't even get fuel to his soldiers. Uh, look at them. This is the Soviet era army. We, we don't want to have anything to do with this. We want to be part of the West. Uh, join the EU. Even, even for all of us, join NATO. That's where any self-respecting, for example, Serbian general would be thinking mm. rationally would say, and so, Piotr, this is the paradox. I call this the Balkans par paradox. Um, um, I, I mentioned this last week in, uh, in London at the uh, British Parliament, the hearings of the Foreign Affairs Committee, where I testified. And I'm in, in uh, speeches in, in the Balkans. Uh, 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 I've mentioned this as well. So you have this paradox, and the paradox has an answer. Uh, it goes like this, Piotr. It's very simple, very clear. The answer is this. The world changed on February 24th of last year. Mm -hmm. But the Balkans didn't change. And that's because Serbia didn't change. And Serbia won't change unless 
the uh, U.S. and sorry, the Euro European Union and NATO speak with one voice in the Balkans. And here we come to my number, uh, Piotr, one. On Ukraine, we speak with one voice across EU and NATO. Uh, you can argue, we can say there's some divisions, but it's not really terribly meaningful. Even Hungary, they've all backed uh, the, the basic position on Ukrainian sovereignty and territorial integrity. But unfortunately, Piotr, the uh, European Union and NATO do not speak with one voice on the Balkans in a very fundamental way. Mm -hmm. The same fundamental way that uh, towards Ukraine. Uh, you could imagine if there were split views about Ukrainian sovereignty, you could imagine how devastating that would be. And that's exactly what we have in the Balkans. We have, uh, we speak with two voices in the Balkans. The majority of uh, EU and NATO countries recognize Kosovo as a fully legitimate, independent and sovereign, keyword sovereign state, part mm -hmm. of the European order. But five EU countries, four of which are NATO members, do not. And because they don't, Piotr, that explains everything in my book. Uh, others may disagree, but in my view, that is by far the primary reason why um, Serbia is, has basically immunity to destabilize three out of four of its neighbors, that is uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Kosovo, and Montenegro, and uh, how uh, Vladimir Putin is able in parallel with uh, Serbia, not, not Serbia as a proxy, but in parallel, pursuing similar agendas to subvert the Western order and advance an order that is aligned ideologically with uh, Putin and with Orban. That's our challenge. And as we come now, you're, this podcast is very timely because the US and EU, as we speak, are engaged in high stakes diplomacy between uh, Serbia and Kosovo. Uh, unfortunately, that diplomacy, despite the best efforts of very capable officials, is uh, uh, burdened by this exact same problem. It comes into it with a cracked foundation because we don't speak with one voice. And as a result, that diplomacy is gonna be very difficult even to get agreement. And even if it does get agreement, uh, Piotr, it could leave Serbia and Russia actually closer, closer, more aligned than they are already. And it could leave, um, Belgrade and Moscow in a position to continue to subvert the Western order. And I can obviously so I'm explain just gonna, that. Your yeah, no, we're, I'm going to jump in there because you, I think you've done a good job of providing us with a um, a few touching points that I want to go into or touch upon um, in, in due course. Uh, the Kosovo relationship to Serbia it particularly is a one sub theme I want to explore later on, given the tensions we saw over the number plates late last year and, and uh, NATO's rather pretty... Uh, unusual uh, worded response um but professor Sowa, um just to remember to on mic on your phone it's in the bottom left corner of your phone um i was wondering if you would like to maybe unpack a few more um comments that uh, professor joseph uh, mentioned um you know from your angle we touched upon uh, peace negotiations and what a peace process would look like in the first two months of the war um how do you see the relationship of uh, the Balkan countries to Russia, but also Europe, right? We've got a few countries that have been candidates for a while. Croatia's about to join the Eurozone, I think in what, a month, two months? So I was just wondering if you could take us through a, a few areas of, of note that you've been uh, paying attention to uh, in the past few months. Yes, I agree with that on the importance of getting the five non-recognizers to recognize Kosovo, but I don't think that's the fundamental problem. The fundamental problem is that Serbia has made a geopolitical choice, uh, and it's made a choice in favor of Moscow and Beijing. It hedges. Use, I used to say it was hedging with Moscow and Beijing. Now it hedges with Washington and Brussels. Oh, okay. The ambition of American diplomats for decades has been a Europe whole and free. That's finished for the moment. Europe will not be whole and free. There'll be a line drawn. Uh, it won't be as strong a line as existed during the period of the Iron Curtain. 
-hmm. but it's still a very clear line. And that line is going to go through the Balkans because Serbia has made a definitive choice in favor of support from Moscow, which is vital to its uh, continued ability to uh, claim sovereignty over Kosovo, or at least over part of Kosovo. Right. So I think uh, I think that's the fundamental problem. I agree entirely. If the five recognizers recognize that that would strengthen Europe's hand and align Europe better with the United States, but the real choice that creates problems has been made in Belgrade, and that choice includes de facto if not de jure claims on territory in Serbia's neighbors. So Serbia wants northern Kosovo, the four Serb, now Serb majority municipalities in northern Kosovo, to be, if not legally part of Serbia, at least factually part of Serbia. It also wants to control municipalities inside Montenegro, if not all of Montenegro. And it wants to control Republika Srpska, the 49% of Bosnia and Herzegovina that uh, at Dayton was allowed to become a kind of autonomous entity within Bosnia and Herzegovina. And those are policy choices by Belgrade. Belgrade could make different choices. I, I would have hoped it would make different choices. But President Vucic in particular, who claimed to be pro-European, has clearly opted instead for a pro-Moscow, pro-Beijing stance, uh, because those capitals will support uh, his uh, opposition to Kosovo independence. And even to some degree, especially for Russia, uh, Serbia's claims to uh, control Serb populations inside Montenegro and Bosnia and Kosovo. Uh, so this is called the Serbian world in Serbia. It's strictly analogous to the Russian world that uh, was used by Putin as an excuse for the aggression against Ukraine. So, Professor, just um, to follow up on that quick point, and then you mentioned Montenegro, which I, I want to bring uh, Pres uh, Professor Vukovic on. But um, you know, what of this? Um, what of this uh, development in the? You know, in all the UN votes, I think it has been all of them, at least, if not bar one, maybe. Serbia has voted to condemn. They voted against Russia. They voted in favor of Ukraine. Um, is that purely just symbolism, purely to try and appease the West or make it look optically yes, like it's an uh, effort to it's, appease it's the West? These votes are taken in the General Assembly where they have basically no serious impact, while Serbia continues very extensive cooperation with the Russian military, with the Russian secret services, and refuses to impose sanctions right. on Russia. It's not that. Serbian sanctions would affect much the outcome of the war in Ukraine, of course, but it's a very clear signal of where Belgrade's true allegiances lie. And they lie today with Beijing and Moscow, not with Brussels and Washington. All right. Well, thank you, Professor. Um, uh, uh, there's a couple of things I want to unpack there, particularly the Republic of Srpska uh, and Bosnia um, in a little bit. But um, you mentioned Montenegro. Uh, Montenegro has elections coming up. Um, Professor uh, uh, Vukovic, uh, I'm going to get the names right. I'm going to remember who's who. Um, welcome and thanks for joining us uh, in such uh, short notice. But uh, really here, keen to hear your perspective on anything that the prof other professors have shared, but also the, the Montenegrin element as you thank you Peter for inviting me and 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 it's always a pleasure to be alongside my colleagues from SAIS and and in engaging these these discussions and um, I'll try to be brief uh, it's very difficult to find gaps in the reasoning of, of the of my uh, 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 interlocutors here uh, but uh, I would like to I would like to emphasize uh, something in addition to what Ed Joseph just mentioned about the 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 discrepancy uh, of the of the voices or the cacophony of voices that are coming in 
from Europe uh, towards the region and the infamous uh, non five non-recognizing countries and, mm -hmm. and the burden they pose onto the peace process. I think uh, uh, alongside that, I think an even bigger burden has become the um, the detachment between U.S. foreign policy uh, approach and the EU, however you now define this cacophony of coming from the EU, mm -hmm. uh, and and what we are seeing is this 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 uh, uh, a very transactional, very uh, quick fix approach by the by the U.S. officials who are trying to. Um, pacify the situation with with some policy that many are commenting as as policies of appeasement trying to kind of buy into the um, cooperation of uh, the especially of Serbia as, as Dan Server was just mentioning um, which uh, many forget is actually against the very nature of the accession process in, uh, in, in within the EU context, because the accession process of the EU context is defined by the Copenhagen criteria. And Copenhagen criteria has nothing to do with the transactional approach. On the contrary, it downplays the transactional approach before all the rule of law and, and, and transitional justice is achieved. And when I say transitional justice, one of the key components of that segment is the uh, acceptance of borders and territory of your neighboring states, not having uh, open territorial claims onto the neighboring states. So by ignoring the Copenhagen criteria, which are the precursor mm -hmm. to any path towards the EU and prioritizing on a uh, uh, short-term transactional approach that emphasizes um, trade and economy uh, in highly asymmetric and highly um, uh, um, um, kind of sus suspicious driven uh, environment actually speaks against each other. These two approaches uh, do are not a good match. And, and, and this type of noise that comes to the Balkans confuses the, the audiences at large mm -hmm. because there are certain types of expectations. You know, what does it mean to have a Western, Western oriented path? So far, for decades, it has been to comply with Copenhagen criteria. All of a sudden now, the emphasis placed on these transactional bonds kind of dilutes the very nature of what it meant to be pro-European back in the days in, in Europe. So now it's very easy to be pro-European in words, but not in substance. And this now plays into another, if I could put it, another uh, 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 flawed um, a policy of the West that has been going on for a long time, and that is to have a very difficult time at understanding the posturing of political elites in the, in the region. Let's not forget, the selection process of who the partners are in the Balkans has often actually led the West to gamble, because this title of your podcast is Gambit, to gamble on the on the elites that actually turned out to be the most anti-European or anti-Western uh, elites on the long run, but they nurtured them. So it's it's this uh, it's this systemic failure to truly recognize rhetoric from substance, from form from substance, to understand who really are the reliable partners in the in the in the in the region, and especially in Serbia, if you want, if you if you think about it from that paradigm. Uh, the conditions in present-day Serbia, where the um, uh, where the uh, approval for the uh, for for EU uh, integration has dropped to thirty percent, which is unprecedented to compare to the rest of the region, mm -hmm. and where there where there is a highly antagonistic rhetoric towards NATO, and a normalization of the idea that uh, 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 NATO should not be seen as a reliable partner. Um, uh, is an utter failure of the of the of the peace building and reconstruction policies of the West in the region, particularly in Serbia, to nurture those types of political elites that can bring about uh, that process of Westernization of that society. So, so this is kind of a a stockpile, if you want, of, mm -hmm. of poorly designed policies that are now just coming to pay. And um, we are seeing them playing out in many of the of the of the scenarios, be it between Serbia and Kosovo, be it within the, the domestic uh, 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 political tug of war in, in Bosnia with a high interference from the outside. So a very inst unstable system, be it in Montenegro, which 
used to be the the front runner towards uh, in, in the EU accession and uh, and the most avid uh, uh, contributor to 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 the NATO policies in the region and now becoming the weakest NATO link in the Mediterranean basin and and actually the the most derailed uh, actor on the EU path and it all thanks to this kind of experimentation with who the partners are and how the partners should be nurtured and how to recognize what really drives them. Is it uh, opportunism or truly the Western values, et cetera, et cetera. So the Balkans, if I may conclude, remind me a little bit of many other places in the world where the U.S. could not clearly define its strategic goals other than, as Dan Server just said, you know, pacified and unified Europe. And similarly, for instance, you had a situation in Sri Lanka in, in 2002 where the U.S. got involved, and I quote the ambassador of the U.S., no, actually, the Assistant Secretary of State for Asian Affairs, why is the U.S. there? Because it's easy. <laughs> because it was approached with such ease, that peace process failed. Dan Server took students to Sri Lanka in uh, a few years after the war ended, and um, uh, we see the results of this kind of very laid back and very opportunistic approach to peacemaking. I'm afraid that we are missing a lot of opportunities along the way. And many of the scenarios that were available just a few years ago are no longer available because the context has changed so dramatically because of these poor choices that I just listed. So I, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, yeah. so um, quite a lot there. Um, well, I mean, I knew this was going to happen. We have three still there. Um, speakers with us uh, after only one broad question, but um, going to Kosovo and Serbia specifically, then and uh, and Professor uh, Joseph, I'm going to come back to you again. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of tensions around license plates, and this has happened at different times in the past few years. You know, you get these flare ups. I was working in Serbia at the time, did well study, I guess, and it sounds a bit fancy if I say working when I'm 29, but. Um, there was a there was a flare up at the time when I was there. Um, you know, how much is the war uh, changing the the overall ability for these two countries to or entities to 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 you know work to find a viable solution? Um, NATO's response, as I mentioned earlier, was particularly strong uh, in the most recent uh, you know flare ups. Uh, and I was just wondering if you could unpack a little bit more how you see the relationship, uh, and then we'll go over to Professor Sowa for his thoughts. Thank you, uh, Piotr. I, uh, and I, I will try to do that. And also, I think, uh, try to uh, bring the, the quite valid points of both uh, Professor Serwer and Professor Vukovic together, where you, you had Professor Serwer saying that this is a strategic choice of Serbia. Uh, that's where he departed about the, the point about the non-recognizers. And you had Professor Vukovic saying, oh, the, the uh, US and EU, they're, they're showing all this weakness, and they're getting off Copenhagen criteria, and they're choosing the wrong partners. And it's all explained, Piotr, the same. And the question you ask about license plates, it all comes back to that same point. It all comes back to the fact that we speak with two voices in the Balkans, not one, in, in the way we are in Ukraine. It's the same point. And, uh, and here, let me give an illustration for your, for your viewers and, and listeners. So you have um, this weakness that Professor Vukovic was talking about. It, it, it's, you, it has to have an explanation. Um, you know, there was this, let me give it, you know, a vivid picture for your viewers, mm -hmm. something that they can imagine in their minds. There was a parade in Sarajevo just last month by, uh, le uh, organized by the separatist Bosnian Serb leader, Milorad Dodik, uh, uh, right in right. eastern Sarajevo. Basically, uh, uh, it was the illegal parade. It was done on this, this holiday. It was done exactly to provoke and say, uh, essentially, the, a campaign to separate Republika Srpska. This is in Sarajevo. The, the, the centerpiece of the, of the U.S. effort to the Dayton Agreement. And at the end, Piotr, at the end, if you can imagine this, um, they gave an award to Vladimir Putin. Can you imagine? This is, this is in Sarajevo. This is, uh, uh, it's, in a way, it's unthinkable that, that, to get away with this. Now, what was the reaction? This is quite instructive, and this will tell you everything. Same with license plates. The U.S. Embassy immediately rebuked Milorad Dodik, Who's, mm -hmm. He's been under U.S. sanctions. He's under British sanctions, obviously, to a very limited effect. Why is it of limited effect? I'll give you the answer. Because in attendance was the Serbian foreign minister, Ivica Dacic, and also the son of the Serbian president was in attendance. Mm -hmm. What rebuke did they get? Guess what? No. Nothing. 
Nothing. Senior U.S. officials met with Dacic in Belgrade the next week. Uh, this is <laughs> why, uh, because it's, it comes back to my point. We speak with two voices. Serbia has the leverage, uh, Piotr. Serbia owns, effectively, Serbia is an EU and NATO member when it comes to Kosovo. Why? Because these five EU countries, four of which are NATO, what they do, Piotr, is this is their position. We won't recognize Kosovo until Serbia does. You see, Piotr, they hand the proxy, they hand the proxy to, to Belgrade. So Belgrade says, well, as long as we don't move, they won't recognize and Kosovo can't move. And that's our interest. What is the Serbian interest? What is the Russian interest? Perpetuate the status quo, Piotr. Keep it a mess. Russia and Serbia do not need a new EU. Explain this in the parliament, in British parliament last. They don't. They need to keep this, as a, a Bosnian Serb uh, politician told me himself, keep it on hot coals. Keep it stirring. Uh, stirring that pot in Montenegro as well. Preventing, complicating the, the efforts of the U.S. to advance Montenegro, which should be well on its path to, to joining the EU. Um, that's not in Serbia's interest for Montenegro to join the EU. Why? Same why it's not in Vladimir Putin's interest for Ukraine to join the EU. It messes everything up. Uh, for, if Ukraine joins the EU, Russians will ask, why aren't we in the EU? If Montenegro joins the EU, Serbs will ask, why aren't we in the EU? That's what it all comes down to. And the weakness of Piotr, let me give you another quick example just to illustrate this for your, for your viewers. It's, this comes on issues not just that are about the Balkans, but issues of great importance to the United States, this war in Ukraine. Do you know last September, uh, President Vucic of Serbia uh, was in, you mentioned the UN General Assembly, he was in New York. He met with Jake Sullivan, who's President Biden's national security mm -hmm. advisor. You can't get much higher than that. He met with him, then he met with Victoria Nuland, very senior official in the State Department. And guess what President Vucic did right after that? after those two senior level meetings with the US in New York on US soil, he turns around, orchestrates the signing of basically a friendship pact yeah, with yeah. Russia, with Sergei Lavrov, who is himself under US sanctions. This is a deliberate embarrassment. Some people might even say it was a humiliation. The US ambassador to Belgrade said that this uh, uh, agreement was designed to justify the war in Ukraine. It doesn't get any more brazen than that. <laughs> Serbia does all sorts of other things. They, they host Russia today. They host Sputnik Serbia. Do you know, I know this, U.S. officials themselves, I know this, you know, are very concerned that the Wagner Group has uh, uh, opened operations in, in Serbia. It's not a joke. So this is serious stuff. This is stuff that concerns us and they're getting away with it. So you have to ask yourself, why on earth would the U.S. most powerful country tolerate this stuff? Why would they tolerate this being embarrassed in New York uh, by this uh, an agreement with Lavrov, this parade in Sarajevo? Why would we tolerate this? It's because Serbia has the leverage. Mm -hmm. That's why, because they own the proxy, because in any confrontation, Piotr, if we confront Belgrade, Kosovo is still blocked. It's always blocked, no matter what we do. And uh, to get the point here, they're, they're on this new policy, they, they have come up with significant consequences for Serbia, their financial, so they say. But there's a question, many questions about whether they, they would be followed through and whether there would be an agreement. Now, quickly, let me come to Professor Serwer, his point, which is quite valid, quite important to say that Serbia has made the strategic choice. This is my argument. This is my contention. Serbia has only one strategic choice. It only has a strategic choice for the West, only the West. Why? Because two thirds of its trade is with the EU because it's surrounded by NATO, all our NATO members or NATO aspirants around it. It has no strategic choice other than the West, except for one reason, we give it to him. We give him this option that Professor Serwer is talking about. He has no option to, to make some strategic choice. Russia represents no strategic option. China represents no strategic option. These are distant powers. He's, he's in the Balkans, in Southeast Europe, as you said at the beginning, Piotr. He has no option unless we give it to him. Mm -hmm. and that's what we do. We, that's what these five countries do. They give him the power, the blocking power, 
And I'm going to close here, Piotr, and let you continue with uh, Professor Sirwer and Professor Butchergen, just to say the relationship with Russia also hinges, totally hinges, 100% on Kosovo, not Kosovo, on the ability to block Kosovo. Once they, uh, there uh, is no longer possible to block Kosovo, that really, Putin needs Kosovo as a precedent to attack, to justify, but he also uses it at the same time uh, to back Serbia. That's again, because of the non-recognizers, because we have a split voice. That's his key narrative, believe it or not, Piotr, his central grievance against the West, what the foundation is Kosovo, circumventing a weakened Russia. I think this reminds us just how complicated uh, the Balkans are and the ethnographic element to conflict in a way that perhaps we didn't really ever consider uh, until 30 years ago and the events that happened in the early 90s. Um, you know, the concept or phrase of ethnic cleansing didn't actually exist until academics coined it in the late 90s because of what happened. Um, Having lived and been out there myself very briefly, uh, admittedly, um, you know, it's 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 a stark reality to see some of the uh, remnants of the conflict, uh, i.e. the Yugoslav Wars uh, from well that well not that long time ago um, when I was probably two. So um, it's it's it, you know I think this has a particular place in in the minds and hearts of of people around the region uh, in terms of what's happening in Ukraine. Um, but Professor Sowa, I would like you to maybe. Um, unpack or expand a little bit on what professor joseph said um if there's anything else you want to add um i'm curious for your thoughts on the added element of the greek um turkish uh, tensions over the i know it's not directly within the region but still it plays into perhaps the sort of broader strategical thinking of other countries um but yeah anything you wanted to add to what professor joseph said <laughs> well once again I, I i do think serbia has strategic choices and it it has made it uh, it, it may not hold forever, but President Vucic has made his choice, and it's the failure of Washington to recognize that that choice has been made and that there is actually nothing we can do to reverse that choice as long as President Vucic is in, is in power. Uh, he has, he dominates the internal political situation completely. He has opposition only on his extreme pro-Russian right. There is no liberal democratic pro-EU uh, opposition in Serbia to speak of. I mean, there are, of course, individuals, but there are even political parties, but they have no power at all. They don't have much resonance in the society. Vucic controls the media in Serbia. And the media in Serbia are virulently anti-NATO, anti-American, anti-Brussels, and pro-Russia and pro-China. That choice has been made. Can it be reversed? I don't think so. I don't think we have the leverage with Serbia required because uh, President Vucic would likely not survive in a Serbia that actually became a serious candidate for EU membership, uh, which entails the rule of law and which would trap him the way my friend Ivo Sanader in Croatia was trapped mm -hmm. by the judiciary there. So I, I just think there's no there there in trying to change Vucic's mind. I do think there's virtue in trying to change the minds of the five non-recognizers in Greece as Ed uh, has documented very extensively, is the closest to being prepared uh, to recognize Kosovo. It has extensive relations with Kosovo. It has an ambassador in Pristina, even though they don't call it an embassy. Uh, you know, they're pretty close, I would say. The question is, what could push them over uh, the threshold? Unfortunately, the others seem unwilling to move, though I, I, I credit uh, the EU negotiator Lajak with recently having very publicly tried to convince uh, some of the non-recognizers to recognize that convincing them won't change Serbia's direction. What it will do is to help Kosovo uh, to be more confident of its own uh, 
sovereignty and territorial integrity. And that right now is very important. Kosovo has a prime minister who has very extensive support in the population. He has support for reaching an agreement with Belgrade, which Vucic does not have support for reaching an agreement, a serious agreement with Pristina. He has support, but it's very conditional support. It's support that depends on real progress towards recognition of Kosovo's sovereignty and territorial integrity. And he knows that, and he's uh, cited six conditions for moving forward with an EU plan that is uh, not recognition, but is a big step in the right direction. So the way I see things today, the Americans are, the American diplomacy today is doing a very ugly thing. <laughs> it's trying to appease our adversary, Serbia, which has made a strategic choice, not for the West, but for the East. And it's trying to strong arm, twist the arm of Kosovo, which is a very pro-EU, pro-American, pro-NATO uh, entity, uh, country. So uh, this is ugly diplomacy. It's the kind of diplomacy we conducted at Dayton in 1995, when we twisted the arm of our of the people we have supported through the Bosnian War, uh, Elia Zbegovic in particular, twisted his arm to accept that half of this country would be governed not by the capital Sarajevo, but by uh, what became Banja Luka initially, Pali. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, twisting the arm of your friends is a lot easier than twisting <laughs> the arm of your adversary. But it's not pretty diplomacy. Very interesting analogy. I, I might use that in the future, although I don't know how many friends it will win me around. Um, if I <laughs> admit I'm approaching the tried twist there, I'm like that. Um, thank you, Professor, for uh, so well for your comments. Uh, and I want to remind everyone that this is a conversation in collaboration with Johns Hopkins uh, Foreign Policy Institute. Please do uh, check out some of their work. You can see the profile on the stage run by uh, the lovely Sophia, uh, who's kind enough to have helped set up this um, conversation. Um, Professor... Um, I want to jump over to you, Professor Vilkovic, um, because, you know, uh, there is one element to this that I, I want to touch upon a little bit. And then I do have a broader question about EU candidacy that I want everyone to have a, a thought on, although we've touched upon a little bit. But specifically uh, on this element of the Republic of Srpska, right? Um, there is this growing notion, I think, among certain policymakers, politicians, uh, analysts, whoever it is, that, you know, we, we're in a delicate, time-sensitive situation, namely that... Uh, because of what's happening in uh, Ukraine, uh, we've seen the emboldenment of pro-Russian or Russian-aligned groups, entities, think uh, Transnistria in Moldova, but also people within the Republic of Srpska. Um, and there is this pushing notion again of separatism, as the professors have both um, uh, highlighted. Um, and so the EU's, at least one article I read, the sort of the rationale is we've got to incorporate or fast track Bosnia into the EU, maybe not as a full candidate, uh, full country yet, but at least as a deeper integrated candidate country so that it can be so that the EU, but by being part of the EU, it protects the it protects the poten uh, against the potential of a conflict breaking out based on ethnographic lines again. Um, what's your what's your take on that? Um you know, do you do would we see something happening elsewhere with other countries around the region, or is just is this just something that's a bit of a slippery slope? Because if you begin to dilute, as you mentioned, the Copenhagen criteria, um, does that threaten the EU project? That's my main concern when it comes to Ukraine, right? Um, Zelensky is doing his shuttle diplomacy to the Brits, to the French, to the Germans, all over the place. Um, and whilst I'm all for Ukraine's independence and sovereignty, I am opposed to them being fast tracked into the EU because of the risks that poses to the European Union. I know some people might not like that, but that's where I firmly stand on this matter. Um, so I do not think Zelensky should be fast tracked into the EU because of the size of the Ukrainian economy, uh, the population 
the um, difference of GDP per capita. There is still corruption issues in Ukraine vis-a-vis uh, -vis the rest of Europe. Um, it's not the level that it was, but still. So, Professor Vukovic, what's your take on this? In a, in a bulk. Um, and, yeah, sorry, it's a long-winded way I of like, just saying a like very simple fact, point. <laughs> and I like and I appreciate the fact that you've made the parallel with Ukraine automatically when you started with, uh, with Republika Srpska, because... Uh, there are multiple parallels here to be made. And I think one one idea to always keep in mind is that Ukraine can learn from the Western Balkans as much as the Western Balkans can learn from Ukraine. Precisely. But even more importantly, the West can learn from both of them simultaneously and see where the flaws have led either of the two um, uh, areas. Um, and, and it just kind of starts very simply. Um, the ethno-national dimension has been ignored both in the in the Western Balkans and in in Ukraine almost as a as a as a as a default setting by the West. You know, kind of shoving it under the rug, pushing it under the rug, ignoring it, trying to create a forward-looking perspective instead of a backward-looking perspective, um, which in, in on paper may actually sound very pragmatic and optimistic, but actually it it is undermined by the existing social cleavages, ethno-national and, and, and others, that undermine any progress you make on all other fronts. In Ukraine, if, if anyone wanted to pay close attention, at least since 2014, but even, even before that, when the Ukrainians were consistently and continuously um, uh, uh, pointing a finger towards Russia, saying that they have expansionist aspirations towards Ukraine based on their ethno-nationalist revisionist historical narrative. What did the West do? They ignored the signals. They, they, they actively ignored the signals. And even more troublesome to this end was the approach that it doesn't matter, that is all talk, let us expand on all of the other fronts that you are now mentioning, corruption, trade, GDP per capita, et cetera, in Ukraine. Let's make Ukraine a better place to be uh, for, for, for its population, because no one rational would do what Russia has done just a year ago. Mm -hmm. right? Signals were there. The writing was on the wall, because we tend to assign rationality that we possess to the rationality of the other. No rationalities are automatically equal. And we need to understand the cognitive bias that drives the behavior of different international actors. So uh, from that mindset, that, that simplistic mindset, the idea was if we expand on trade, there is this liberal peace mentality that trade brings people together and they kind of reconcile their past differences because of the transactional gains that they obtained um, uh, on, on the immediate front from that trade. So my colleague at Joseph just mentioned it, that Serbia, for instance, doesn't. And, and this is a, this is a very dominant narrative in the West. Serbia does not have an alternative but the West, because the West is, is its largest trading partner. If I want to be cynical to that narrative, and I'm not accusing anyone of it, I'm just saying that th this narrative carries such cracks. If I want to be cynical, who is the largest trading partner of China? Are uh, they getting closer? <laughs> Are we seeing who was the largest trading partner of Russia prior to the invasion? Was Russia integrating into the EU automatically because of its extensive trade with, with Europe? No. Trade keeps you stable. It does not deepen your relationships. So the narrative that the e, that the, that that Serbia should come to its senses, not just Serbia, and and I don't want to kind of gang up on Serbia here. This is not just the problem in Serbia. This is the problem in, in region as a whole because we have all of these political elites that try to capitalize on on the on the uh, uh, on the weaknesses and blind spots of the West. Uh, that uh, you know, the narrative is you trade with us, so you are like us. It doesn't work. There, this is a question of values. This is a question of principles. This is a question of norms. It has to do with the track record that has been achieved so far. So the 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 signals that I just mentioned earlier from Ukraine that that, that were indicating that the ethno national uh, uh, approach and aspirational expansionist attitude of Russia should not be ignored, should equally be understood in the Balkans. 
trade did not transform Russia. Trade did not transform China. Trade does not transform anyone. That's not the purpose of trade. And, and I know the, 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 the reflex of, of liberal institutionalism from early 1990s, the, the, the whole end of mm -hmm. history, our former colleague here, Francis Fukuyama, who said, you know, this is now the, the, the ushering of the new era. We are, not, we, we are way past that. We, we have learned the lesson that that's not the way to achieve that. So, so asking difficult questions and addressing those crucial signals is something that needs to be embedded in that narrative of the EU and, and, and the US. Russia is winning in the Balkans when it comes to soft power, which is a paradox because that is the, the tool that the West was used in Eastern Europe during the Cold War. And the, 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 the weakness of soft power of the West is the, the poor selection of, of, of counterparts, the, the, the partners in, in the region, deep experimentation with some very opportunistic political elites, and this blind spot of thinking that trade makes a significant, uh, significant difference. Trade... Peter, I wonder if I can interrupt the natural order of things. Uh, <laughs> Just um, go. If you if you do, I just ask you to unmute on Twitter. Don't forget, yeah. Professor Sowa. Um, so yes, if I can, <laughs> if I can interrupt the natural order of things um, uh, to go back to your question, your very specific about question about Ukraine, should it uh, be fast tracked into the EU? Right. And I think the short answer to that question for all the countries that aren't EU members in the Balkans, as well as for Ukraine is that there is no fast track to the EU. All of them will face a really uphill battle. The EU has significantly uh, uh, strengthened the criteria. You, you, but you I, have to, you but have as to they, do as they much more them. today than you had to do 30 years ago to, to enter the EU. What's really happening, it seems to me, is that we're using candidacy as a kind of promise of an EU or a NATO perspective. And I, I understand that. And I think in particular circumstances, it's entirely justified. But given uh, the situation today inside NATO, for example, do I expect Ukraine within a foreseeable future, say 10 or even 15 years, to become a member of NATO? No, I don't, because there'll be at least one NATO member that says no to that prospect. But I can picture NATO developing a relationship with Ukraine out of the relationship of support that NATO is providing during the war. Right. That will make it a kind of virtual member of the alliance. So, Professor... And Sorry, go ahead. I, I want to just jump in on this point when you uh, when you finish that point. because Well, I, I, I think that, that kind of... That kind of virtual membership is something that we should be thinking about more in general, not only for NATO, but also for the EU. That, uh, you know, sometimes it's seen as a way station that will delay EU membership or something like that. But the fact of the matter is that even the most advanced countries in the Balkans in terms of membership in the EU, Montenegro and Serbia, are still a long way off from membership, especially if you take the Copenhagen criteria seriously, which mm -hmm. of course you must. Yep. So I, I do think that some kind of enhanced relationships, more than the stabilization and association agreements, uh, is, is appropriate for countries that you want to qualify. And uh, I think the EU should want Ukraine to qualify, partly for the reasons you mentioned, Piotr, its size and uh, importance uh, geographically and economically. Well, I, I, just, just on that point, but I, I mentioned those not necessarily because they are, well, they could be eventually assets, but at the moment they are liabilities because Ukraine 
it doesn't have the construction meeting the Copenhagen criteria yet that I think warrants their full admission. Uh, as I say, I'm not against Ukraine joining eventually, um, but just on this point, because you're talking about it, it's a it's a cherry, you know, it's a it's a carrot, right? It acts as an attraction for aspiring candidate countries or applicant countries to become candidates. And then you gain access to, you mentioned it, the Stabilization Association program or process, which is um, basically for listeners. It's the uh, process by which which that uh, countries acclimatize, uh, align themselves to the basic criteria of the EU. There are obviously different levels of integration, right? Um, we can talk all about this through Brexit as an example of how much we wanted to be integrated or not. Um, but the thing is, um, Professor, just to build on this point, and please, uh, you know, continue with what you were saying as well, but... Um, isn't it also just a case that it acts as a bit of a security reassurance as well? Because if you're part of the EU in this candidacy, you begin to receive funding, you could begin to be integrated into very loosely, I guess, but interoperability with sort of intel provision. The EU doesn't have an army, but it does have obviously a defense and foreign policy arm to it. That's what Joseph Burrell's entire focus is. But is it a bit more not just about the symbolic attraction, um, but also the, 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 the shall we say, um, provision of policy light, right? It's a it's a it's a Coke light version. Instead of full integration to NATO, it's just that they they have access to some certain better communications and 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 assets like that. Is it? Is, My is short answer is thing? yes, but I see Ed wants to intervene. Thanks. Okay, go Dan, ahead, Ed. Thank you, and uh, Peter. Um, I, I want to come to address this point, and and Sunish, I think, uh, put his finger on on really the the key uh, question there when he spoke about these ethno national divisions in, in history, and uh, uh, and it's a really a poorly understood aspect of this. And Dan, just to quickly mm -hmm. uh, uh, answer this question about Ukraine and European Union, uh, my view is uh, quite different. We are um, financing- I thought, it, I thought it might be. Uh, yes. Something to... <laughs> yes. Uh, well, and uh, but I uh, will give you the reason, Piotr, and I hope you'll uh, uh, agree with me on the reason. We are financing Ukraine to the tune of 40 billion US dollars and more. Um, we're not, uh, we're, we're providing, we've crossed all these thresholds of, of concern, um, Piotr. Uh, even now providing tanks, there's a request you just saw, Zelensky asking for uh, aircraft, which is under consideration. It's not ruled out of hand. Mm -hmm. um, we're not going to do this, uh, provide all of this to the tune of $40 billion, $50 billion, all of this, in order to keep Ukraine in some kind of a gray zone holding zone. It may not, Dan is right, of course you can't fast track it, but uh, the, the days of um, gray zones and holding patterns, those are gone. Um, uh, again, this is you, before February uh, 24th of last year, perhaps we're in a new era now. This you better a, tell the Swedes in the this is a, let, let me just finish. There's, this is a geopolitical struggle. Uh, we're, we're not, this is not kidding around with, with $40 billion and so forth to just then uh, say, oh, well, you, and by the way, you get a consolation prize. Uh, it, it's, uh, this is a, a commitment, a strategic commitment. People are talking about Ukraine, part of NATO. This is inevitably where it goes. Uh, we don't know what the final settlement will be, but um, that's, you don't commit 40 billion, give tanks, uh, do all of this training, and then say, and by the way, you get a consolation prize. This is, this is we're, we're in this, this is a serious uh, struggle. This is uh, recognition of the strategic impact that it has on the United States and every country I, in the I EU and NATO. You, let, let me just finish. I just I want to ask you to reflect, to, I, I want reflect to on the American hang on, hang on. I know, the I know, Dan. Union. I know Let's... it will take a long time, and Dan is right. Okay. Dan is absolutely right that you, you know, there's no such thing as a fast track. He's absolutely right about that. But what my point is that we're not going with some, uh, you don't go 40 billion and then a holding zone. This is, that's just uh, not on. Um, let me quickly come to this, because Sinesha put his finger on really an essential point, what he said, you know, uh, everyone is, is burying this, uh, uh, these ethno-national uh, divisions and, and uh, uh, arguments about history, and he's absolutely right. We come back, Piotr, why we're paying 40 billion, why we're doing all this, and why we're so stuck in the Balkans, because it, it comes back one order, the, the way we have a way to address exactly those issues that uh, that uh, Sinesha is talking about. And they exist, uh, Piotr, they exist all over Europe. This is the point. Mm -hmm. They exist in Ukraine. 
Crimea, who's is Crimea? Who is this Russian speakers? Who, who's history? They exist in the Balkans. The Balkans are famous for this, but not only across Europe, Spain, you have Catalonia, you have Scotland, you have very, these divisions. We have one way of dealing with these, Piotr, the democratic way. We deal with these in uh, along our values. We discuss these issues. We, we make compromises. We, we, we negotiate and broker agreements like that between Greece and North Macedonia, which is a stable agreement. We have models of dealing with this. That's if we go along our order. That's our order. The Putin order is raw power, subversion, and ethno-national division. And that's what Serbia is doing. And what I'm telling you is here, Piotr, this is all subsidized, enabled, empowered by these five countries. Because what do they do? This is the po key point I made in London at the hearing, is everyone thinks, and Dan pointed this out, that Kosovo's blocked, Kosovo's blocked. And that's a big problem. Dan is right. It's a big problem for us that Kosovo's blocked. But what are they doing at the same time? They deny Kosovo, but they affirm the Serbian narrative. They affirm Serbia's sovereignty. What does that mean? You, you, it means you affirm Serbia's narrative. Exactly, Sinesha, Serbia is a victim. You, you affirm Serbia is um, entitled to, quote, compensation, which is, as Dan suggested, in the form of territory. These are Putin solutions. The Russian ambassador to Serbia just spoke about these, making these linkages. Again, they want to do basically a trade of Crimea, ultimately Crimea for Kosovo. We'll trade mm -hmm. you at the UN. Putin still wants to do this. There, remember, one order. We cannot, we're not anymore in a position to tolerate gray zones. We have our order, not the Putin order. And so what the, the way this works, you know, to, to make it so clear for your audience, the way this works is these five non-recognizers, four really, the, the main ones are in NATO, that's Greece, uh, Romania, Slovakia, Spain, what they're doing, if, whether uh, it, intentionally or not, and in some ways it's kind of intentional, is they back Serbia's sovereignty claim. They say, you're right, Serbia. Your sovereignty was violated by this. And Serbia in turn says, yes, our, our sovereignty was violated. And how do they speak? Uh, Sinisha talked about this. How do they speak about the history filter? What do they talk about? You know when history begins for President Vucic and for most Serbs? It begins in 1999 on Kosovo, when, when they, we were bombed. We were bombed and we're victims. What do they not talk about? 1989, when Serbia unilaterally pushed through in, in former Yugoslavia before the fall of the Berlin Wall. The Soviet Union was still intact. An aggressive bid to dominate Kosovo and to dominate Yugoslavia. That's what they did. They took away the autonomy of Kosovo unilaterally instituted 10 years of repression. And this is what, and, and, and we know the rest of the facts, uh, uh, the, those mean, terrible Kosovo uh, Albanians, weren't they terrible? Really? They were led by the only pacifist leader in the region, Ibrahim Rugova. They didn't get any weapons, serious weapons, till 1997, almost a decade later. And, uh, and the US cracked down on them. We never backed, we never told Serbia, hey, Kosovo has to be independent. When we went to Milosevic, our ask was restore the autonomy, even a lower level of autonomy. It's all bunk. It's all bunk. It's a revisionist narrative that is empowered by these countries, these five countries, because what they say, and this is why the, the testimony has resonated in the region, is this is what they're doing. Mm -hmm. They say, Serbia, you're right. Your narrative is correct. And that's the Putin narrative. That's the Vucic narrative. And that's, that's what is empowered here. And, and uh, it's very simple, uh, Piotr. Right. If, if they do not, it, once they would recognize Kosovo, it would all be different. And um, what Dan's point is, oh, well, they would continue. Um, and by the way, Sinesh, let me just quickly say this. Sinesh's point about trade, he's making, Sinesh is making the argument, we agree, he's making the argument that I did in my article on open Balkans and totally agreeing with Sinesha. The, the notion I wrote in that article, this was about open Balkans, that it's uh, not only unwise, it's dangerous. He, Sinesha is absolutely right because trade does not equal trust. Uh, Ukraine, Russia, um, who is um, Taiwan's number one uh, trading partner? It's China, obviously we know that. It is no substitute for that. That's exactly what I'm saying. 
the, my point about Serbia's strategic position, it isn't that they make friends through trade. Um, we know Montenegro's number one um, trading partner, imports and exports, is Serbia and their relationship. Yeah. But it's not that it's not that it's that you take away this leverage that they have. You take away this ability. Their narrative. You guess right. what you take away? You take away Serbia's immunity, the immunity from scrutiny. And then you force Alexander Vucic into a decision. The one that Dan says, oh, he'll still make. Dan says he'll still make it. I say he won't. I say he has no option because uh, to make that option, to continue without the leverage over Kosovo, he'll, he can be sanctioned. He's, 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 the, he's just another Balkan leader without the leverage of Kosovo. He has Serbia, any Serbian leader, the most extreme, has no option once you take the Kosovo leverage away, no option other than to choose the West. Not because they'll be friends for trade, because economically, and Russia and China do not fulfill in any way, shape or form. There's only one strategic option when you take away the Kosovo leverage. Thank you, Piotr. Um, thank you, Professor. I, I appreciate your um, impassioned um, points. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's quite healthy to see our own faculty members. Um, I don't know if you want to say disagreeing, but pushing back. And um, Professor Sober, before I um, come to um, my last sort of minor point that I'd like you guys to to share brief contributions on, um, because my laptop is running out of battery. Uh, Professor Sower, do you have anything you want to, uh, you know, push back on, well, clarify? I, I would only make two points. When, when it comes to whether people and whether countries end up in a gray zone, it all depends on unanimity on the question of accession to EU or NATO. So Finland and Sweden didn't expect to end up in a gray zone when it came to NATO membership. But that's where they're ending up for at least temporarily uh, because of Turkey. And that may last for a long time. I don't really know how long it's going to last. The second point I would make is that the fact that we're spending 40 billion on uh, Ukraine's defense tells us almost nothing about the relationship with Ukraine after the war, except insofar as Ukraine uh, has homogenized itself with the rest of NATO. But we spent much, much more in contemporary dollars on uh, the defense of the Soviet Union before we entered World War II than we're spending on Ukraine. But we ended up as adversaries of the Soviet Union. Now, I don't expect that with Ukraine, but there is no guarantee of Ukrainian membership in either the EU or NATO. And in, in terms of NATO, I feel reasonably confident to predict that there will be more than one country that will feel like Piotr feels about the EU. It's not time. Let's not do this. It's too big. It's too hard to defend. It's too close to Russia. Let's Let's support Ukraine, have a good relationship with it, supply it with all the military goods and training that it needs, but let's not make it an EU member, a uh, NATO member, would be my prediction for the first 10, 15 years after this war. So, uh, Professor Vukovic, I, I want to come to you just for your sort of, you know, forward looking thoughts, but I'm going to premise it with this, which is that. I'm not against Ukrainian um, candidacy and membership of the European Union, but not now. And they need to, and it needs to be done properly. It needs to be done effectively, um, and uh, we need to consider to what level of integration that uh, this is done. Um, the expenditure on the war uh, is an element, but I do not still think that that justifies uh, Ukraine just joining uh, the European Union just because. Uh, I also think, and not that any of you gentlemen have said that in, in this way, but some people who conflate a Ukrainian membership with the EU with NATO, they're very different entities. Uh, and I personally, uh, when I asked this to um, Alexander Vindman, Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman in November, also a fellow of SAIS, Foreign Policy Institute, you know, about the hypocrisy of the West 
and uh, this idea that, you know, uh, not enough consideration was made for Russia's uh, national security concerns or, or the um, very fast and large scale expansion of NATO. No, no, I'm not defending Russia's actions in Ukraine at all, but I do think that it is important to acknowledge and recognize that things perhaps could have been done a little bit more effectively in the late 90s, uh, early 2000s vis-a-vis -vis Russia and, and the spillover effect it has on the Balkans. Um, but Professor Vukovic, what's your thoughts on sort of that element, if there's anything you want to touch upon that Professor Joseph and Serwa have mentioned, um, uh, as well as also your thoughts for sort of where do we go from here, if that's even a question you can respond to effectively. <laughs> I will try, and 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 I appreciate the, the the challenging nature of the questions and the broad scope that they're trying to to achieve. Um, uh, the forward-looking perspective um, may come in different shapes and forms, and again, it, it all depends on the lenses we want to use. So let me use the pessimistic lens, um, and and not the pessimistic lens for the sake of of uh, trying to find a negative outcome, but for the sake of not learning from experience. And that, that's that's the that's the warning that one needs to always go back to uh, when it comes to the unfolding events in Ukraine. It still uh, it still uh, 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 impresses me the slack resistance that exists in the West to truly comprehend and accept the very uh, uh, nuanced nature of the hybrid threat that Ukraine has been under since 2014 before the invasion. Mm -hmm. um, I do not think that even with all of the expenditure that we have been discussing so far and all of the uh, 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 contemplation about the prospect of, of uh, Ukraine joining NATO or the EU and or the EU um, has been included in that calculus. The calculus is void of this understanding what has Ukraine been experiencing that precipitated into something that the intelligence services of the U.S. clearly indicated as in inevitable, while the policymakers were trying to uh, uh, placate the situation by saying, well, you know, we still haven't crossed the Rubicon up until the 24th of February last year, right? So th there was that that level of, of intentional um, uh, uh, ignoring of the writing on the wall. Um, if you think about the the, the hybrid use of Russian uh, 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 of, of Russia's uh, 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 portfolio of threats, from uh, religious organizations to civil society organizations to the media landscape to cyber attacks to uh, corruption and political uh, and 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 co-opted political elites to sports, if you want. Uh, uh, none of those elements play a role in the policy making of the EU towards uh, towards Ukraine. In, in fact, they're all ignored. And the reason why I'm mentioning them is that they are tested yet again, very actively in the Balkans. Because we see that slack resistance from the West to respond to those types of threats, to respond to the to the hybrid sharp power of Russia, and in this case, of Russian uh, uh, partners in the region, that see an opening. Because again, the emphasis by the Western policymakers towards the, towards the region has been, let's look forward, let's not dwell on differences, let's see where what we have in common. Mm -hmm. For Ukraine is telling us how far these threats can go and how dangerous it is to ignore them. And, and even more problematic is that it's so difficult for the, the West to make those parallels with the region. So being uh, 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 unable or unwilling to make the parallels, we get to the scenarios where we see the West continuously repeating the same models that have failed in the past in the Balkans, they seem to replicate them. So you've, meant, you've asked me about the Republika Subska as an example, right? That, you know, the secessionist drive, et cetera. Now, the talk of the day is the association of Serbian municipalities in Kosovo. And usually you will see uh, uh, within the within the uh, punditry and within the policy making community this parallel that, you know, Vucic is trying to make another Republika Subska in, in Kosovo. I would actually nuance even more uh, uh, around it. 
the association, so the new project, even after everything we have learned about the, the shortcomings of, of the model such as Republika Srpska, the new model that is being tested now uh, in the talks over, over uh, the, the normalization between Serbia and Kosovo, the association is even worse than Republika Srpska. Because if that agreement is implemented, that association would be the only entity that is recognized by all participants in the negotiations. I see. Serbia would recognize an entity within Kosovo, although it doesn't recognize Kosovo. It would have a higher legitimacy than the state within which it operates. And that's how dangerous it is, because Republika Srpska, for all its flaws, it still does not have the legitimacy that is higher than Bosnia and Herzegovina. Because Serbia still at least formally recognizes Bosnia and Herzegovina as an independent state. So even with the lessons learned of the past, the model that is being applied is even worse than the worst case scenario we have experienced so far. And that's what I'm trying to warn about the forward looking in Ukraine, is that with all of the writing on the wall that led to the invasion in, two, in, in, in 2022, we are, yet, we are yet to see anyone in the West to seriously address all of the hybrid sharp power threats coming from Russia and coming from uh, uh, Russian partners in the region that use the same template and even the same playbook uh, in, 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 in managing the complexities of their own region and, and near abroad. So that's my warning kind of uh, uh, as we look forward to what, what the future of Ukraine is and of the region. Thanks, Professor. That's not an element that I had um, been following as much uh, and something that I think we should all look into a little bit more. There I agree go. with my, my colleagues okay. uh, in the main about the Association of Serbian Municipalities should be settled in the final agreement, not now. Right. Uh, when it uh, comes to optimism and pessimism, I, I, I certainly share Sinisha's pessimism in the short term and the warning that what Russia is doing in, in uh, Ukraine, it would like to do by other means, not by military means uh, in the Balkans. That said, if we expand the time frame to 10 or 15 years and ask ourselves, you know, is, is Russia going to be a problem in 10 or 15 years? And the answer might well be yes, it's going to be a problem. But it's going to not be the problem that it is today, no, it seems no. to me. No. Russia has fatally weakened itself with the war in Ukraine. I believe it will lose this war. I think it will lose all the territory it has gained in Donbass and probably Crimea as well. And, uh, you know, when that happens, Russia's role in the world is going to be vastly diminished. That's not the purpose of the West, but I think that will be a result of what's going on. Thank you very much, Professor Soa. And thank you very much, everybody um, who has been watching on YouTube. Um, as you can see, we do have quite the diverse array of opinions here. Uh, a couple of takeaways for me is just how um, divided we can see the Balkans still 30 years on, even within their own, um, so we say, respective challenges, let alone um, from exogenous ones that are exacerbating the existing challenges. Um, uh, I've got a lot I think I need to reflect on, uh, and it shows you that I think we can uh, continually think about the role that great powers have. Uh, and that what we thought was, you know, no longer the case of kinetic warfare in Europe very much still is a possibility. And the spillover effects it can have for the membership of supranational organizations, be them something like NATO or the European Union. If you enjoyed this conversation, remember to subscribe, hit the like button, leave a comment, share the video around. Um, and I look forward to future conversations with other members of Johns Hopkins Science's Foreign Policy Institute, which this was in collaboration with. Take care, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us on YouTube uh, and speak to you soon.